you so much, uh, Dr. Manan, for the invitation, uh, firstly, and uh, thank you to the Center for Language Translation and Cultural Studies for organizing this, for having me over here. It's a pleasure. It's an honor. I'm uh, fascinated to learn more about the Bengal Repository Project. Um, I, it's, it's wonderful to know how many interviews and material you've already collected. Um, and I look forward to learning from it. I, I think we know much more of this. I think there's also been a much more uh, acute awareness of the fact that partition literature to date has predominantly looked at 1947 through Punjab's lens, and, and there, there are particular reasons for that, of course, the kind of uh, exodus uh, and uh, the overnight kind of violence that we saw uh, has consumed many of us. And my work um, on, on these subjects, on partition particularly, is primarily through the up as well. Of course, later on, I moved on to Kashmir. Uh, I haven't worked in Indian administered Kashmir. It's Pakistan administered Kashmir that I've looked at. But then, you know, that book then took me to 1971. And um, there, my focus was very much on the birth of Bangladesh, on the events post-partition. But during the course of that research, I did get to focus a little bit um, in a limited way on, on the partition of Bengal in 1947 as well. But, but my work kind of organically took me there. I think when I first started off, uh, the way I imagined partition was very much from Punjab's lens in this first book, The Footprints of Partition, which I started writing back in 2012, I believe it was, um, was, was, was from that lens. And I came to it um, from a very personal kind of project. My work is not academic. Um, it isn't a result of a PhD, uh, you know, thesis or anything of that sort. It, it resulted um, because I think very much so because I was brought up in Punjab. I was brought up in Lahore. And I think there is a, there's a difference um, on the Indian side of Punjab and the Pakistani side of Punjab. I'll talk more about this during the course of, of today's lecture. But I think that and on the Pakistani side of Punjab, partition is very much part of the larger um, fabric of society. It's very much part of the larger discourse in society. It's very, very present. Um, it is, it's there in our family histories. It's there in the larger national narratives, because we have to remember that partition for Pakistan is also the birth of Pakistan. So it becomes very, very important to that birth story. And it is then echoed uh, through different sites, whether that is textbooks or, or media, or just the larger, uh, larger kind of discourse prevalent in and around society. Um, so, so I grew up with this uh, narrative and a kind of an understanding of partition, but it was during the course of this book, and I'm going to read from my prologue, it'll become a little bit clearer, I'm happy to take any questions. It was during this course, the course of this book that I started to realize that a lot of the narratives, a lot of that understanding of partition, which was very present as I grew up, was limited in the sense that there's certain narratives of these larger meta events that come forth and other narratives that kind of recede or are pushed to the periphery. Now, there are many reasons for this. Of course, one is, is the sheer trauma of partition. Um, you know, if you look at it from a psychological perspective and something very, very traumatic happens, it's often those charged memories that kind of sit at the forefront um, that and they kind of push other softer memories uh, to, the, to the back. But I think there are also other reasons for this. And, and the primary one that I look at is how nation states craft narratives. Um, and all nations do this. This is not something that is specific to Pakistan. It's also not something that's specific just to South Asia. I think across the world, you will find this and the different tools and techniques that are used to craft national narratives. But essentially what happens is that histories, narratives, language, words that are inconvenient to those national histories uh, tend to get censored, tend to sometimes get distorted um, and, and erased as well. And so um, sitting in Pakistan, the version of, uh, of partition that I had access to for the majority of my life was a limited, was a myopic narrative. Um, and it is through the course of doing, the, doing this oral history work in Punjab um, that, that I started to realize that partition had to be looked at on a spectrum. It, ha it had layers and layers of narratives. It had competing narratives, uh, 
con conflicting narratives and that's all part of the story and that work then of course took me to India um, that revealed its own partition narratives and then took me to Bangladesh which has its own partition narrative and understanding so that's something I'm curious about that's something I, I'm very interested in um, I don't believe history is, is static in that sense it's I don't believe 1947 is an event in that sense I think that it is very much an ongoing process um, these events get shaped reshaped imagined reimagined crafted and recrafted uh, based on post events right what happened post partition has a has a deep impact on the memory of partition today so that's kind of my outlook I look at both um, state histories state narratives and then I I juxtapose them with with people's history to see how the two uh, interact with each other so what I'll do at this point is I'll read from uh, the prologue of, uh, of uh, Footprints of Partition, the first book. Uh, I will ask you to keep in mind that, as I mentioned, I wrote this uh, back in 20, uh, 2012. It didn't end up coming out till 2015. Um, so it's been over uh, a decade now. And, um, you know, I think so much has changed uh, and my own understanding in many ways has shifted as well. The other thing I'd just like you to keep in mind is that uh, this is primarily written from a Pakistani perspective, so the narratives that I was consuming. And I think that's important to, to underscore over here because of partitioned histories. Uh, it can it can sometimes, um, you know, I, what I wouldn't want is this to appear as, as once I did. Um, I think this work then later took me to India to kind of under, better understand the narratives over there and the fault lines over there. Um, and that's mentioned later on in the book. I won't get into that section, but just keep in mind that this is particularly from a uh, from a Pakistani perspective of growing up in Lahore. So I remember sitting squeezed at the back of a small silver curé on the way back to Lahore from Sahiwal when the idea of writing this book struck me. I turned towards my then fiance Harun and told him I'd heard the most beautiful story the afternoon before. It was one that had to be documented. The story was of a Pakistani man in his 70s, desperately longing to go visit his home in Amritsar that he had left behind as a child at partition. He told me that once he had come close to visiting when he was traveling to Kadian for a religious procession alongside other members of the Ahmadiyya community. He had stood at the Vaga border and then passed through Amritsar in a bus trying to soak in as much as he could. But he couldn't get off. He couldn't visit his home despite being so near. Pakistan and India only issue city visas. His was limited to Kadian, and his home wasn't in the allowed perimeters. He had cried while narrating the incident, and in a choked voice, he told me it was his dying wish to be able to see his neighborhood one last time. It remained just a wish, for he passed away a few months later. At this time, I was heading the oral history project for the Citizens Archive of Pakistan, uh, CAP, in Lahore and Islamabad. Now, CAP is a nonprofit organization dedicated to cultural and historic preservation of Pakistan. As part of the oral history project team, conducting interviews had become my source of bread and butter. Over a period of almost three years, I conducted 600 such in-depth interviews. Now, this includes both the initial interviews, but also the follow-up uh, interviews and conversations that I had. I conducted these interviews both for CAP as well as independently, mostly in and around Lahore and across different socioeconomic classes. The narratives as expected were very often imprinted with horrific memories of torture, rape, lootings, kidnappings, death, and displacement. These bloody accounts were similar to the ones I had heard from my own maternal grandmother who had served at Lahore's largest refugee camp at Walton. They were also similar to what I had read in my history textbooks as a student. Some people were open to readily sharing, others more reluctant. Sometimes I had to return again and again before people were willing to open that chapter of their lives with me. And at other times, the very first interview ran for hours and hours, one horror story rolling in after the other. Some cried during the interviews, and others spoke about losing entire families without as much as a tremble. However, what also started to come forth alongside these narratives were other experiences, experiences that I was unfamiliar with, experiences that I had not read or heard anywhere before. And even if they had been mentioned by my grandparents or others in this anecdote or that, they remain so insignificant in my larger framework and understanding of history that I brushed them away without much thought. These were stories of joint festivities, of sending mithai or sweets to each other's home at Diwali and Eid before partition. Stories of school friends, stories of neighbors who were more like family, stories of rescue rather than vengeance at partition. <laughs> 
stories of post partition divided families, of wanting to travel across the border, of the desire to visit their abandoned homes and friends. One such recent narration had moved me. Vikar, who was 13 at the time of partition, had left behind his family's 350 year old Haveli in India to come to Pakistan. But as Vikar told me, the relations his family held with Meerut for over three centuries could not be eradicated overnight. And I quote him here, even when I go back now, all these years later, they always embrace me. I remember the first time I visited Meerut again was in 1956, almost 10 years after partition. My neighbors and friends clung to me and began weeping. The women gathered around me too. They were crying and asking for my mother and sisters. They, these were my people, my home, we had lived together for so long. How could we forget one another? Vikar told me that even today, half of his family income comes from his mango orchards in Meerut. It is looked after by his neighbors and friends, many of whom are Sikhs and Hindus. Some would rightly attribute the such recollections to an idealization of the past, of the lost days becoming greener than they were. In one of the largest studies conducted on the political psychology of partition, political psychologist Ashish Nandi makes note of this. And I quote her, there is a utopianism or repeated references to life in undivided India as flawless, rosy in every respect, a utopia of nostalgia. Most respondents see nothing wrong with their life before partition. It was the division of the country that started their problems. Before 1947, they had nothing to worry about. Sardar Vasudev Singh Bendra, a refugee from Rawalpindi says, there was nothing wrong with our life there. We had everything, land, respect in the community, prosperity. Only after 47, we suddenly had nothing. Now historical research and facts show that fault lines existed prior to partition as well. Riots and arguments would break out between different communities, albeit as isolated events rather than the large scale chaotic violence that partition brought. And there were many instances of oppression and discrimination. However, as Vakar stated, even when relationships became tense, it was not possible to completely break away from the other. The multicultural dynamics of the pre-partition years were different, with almost a co-dependence of one community on the other. The religious and cultural identities that became crystallized at partition were far more diluted and fluid in the preceding years. Rajmohan Gandhi explains this in his writing, and I quote, normal life usually prevailed on the ground and cordial exchanges took place during festivals. Though the century old tension between purity of belief and purity of birth was present even in the 30s and 40s. If this tension remained part of Punjab's climate, the Punjabi's ability to put it to one side was a stronger part, end quote. It is my understanding that partition was too complex an event and the pre-partition years too multi-layered to, multi to be neatly packaged into categories of hate or friendship, rescue or violence. This is especially so because it was often the same people who narrated both stories of bonds and loss, of comradeship and hostility from different instances of their lives. That dichotomy between good and bad, between violence and harmony was blurred for many of them. It is not my job to testify which versions of history, the dark or the rosy, are the correct ones. Instead, partition stories need to be looked at as shades on a spectrum and understood as experiences, each unique to the storyteller. How they recollect, how and what they choose to remember depends on their own individual process and for me personally is as important as any historical fact. What was of personal interest during these interviews then was that if such recollections existed of happier days and intercommunal bonds before, um, uh, both before and after partition, why had they not been shared more often? And why was I only hearing of them now? At this time, I've, I've written that over here about five years ago, but now this is closer to 15 years ago. I was a fresh 22-year-old uh, university graduate and was only beginning my journey of exploring my own history, both as a family and as a nation. The idea that my learning until now had been filtered was both new and distressing for me. I began to realize that often such stories would be uttered casually as a long pause in larger narratives of violence and displacement. One reason for this was how people remembered and recalled partition. The other was because I too had become a selective listener. Being a product of a security state that views its neighbors, especially the Eastern one with great suspicion and animosity, I could not quite reconcile that with the fact that partition survivors would want to revisit the horrific past, that they would want to go back to see their friends and homes, that they could still consider them as friends and see the other country as home in the first place. 
wasn't the whole reason that Pakistan was created to stay away from them and what they had done to us. After all, we had fought major wars with India. The Kashmir issue had been burning while I was growing up in the 90s. And I was often told by my school teachers and even my own grandmother that Hindus were treacherous and mischievous people, that they would discriminate against uh, Muslim, uh, Muslims and abuse Islam. I was told that India was a major player in creating the current instability in Pakistan. Media channels further reiterated this line of thought by endorsing India as an arch rival and enemy of Islamabad. Even as I write this, conflict at the border has heightened. Another headline states how India has been accused of violating the Indus Water Treaty. Thus, as a listener, I was tuning in and out unconsciously. When accounts are drawn in of how Muslims were treated like untouchables, of how there were separate Muslim and Hindu water fountains in schools, of how Muslim women only had a choice between being raped or drowned in already overcrowded wells, I would become ever attentive. These stories fit into my expectations of partition. The other ones seem like an anomaly, perhaps just experiences of a handful, not important enough to engage with. It was only when I spoke to the man in Sahiwal that something switched on within me. His tears, his cracking voice, his trembling hands pushed me to think about his reality. It also pushed me to question my listening skills, my own prejudices as a researcher. I started going back to the interviews and later to the interviewees I had conducted before Sahiwal and was surprised how many other interviewees like Vikar had offhandedly mentioned the name of a Hindu or Sikh friend prior to partition, of how a description of Lahore was incomplete without the mention of Diwali celebrations at Lakshmi Chak. In the interviews I conducted from that day onwards, I became ever conscious of this. Slowly, the interviewees and I began to explore the hidden layers of narratives they held within. At the slightest encouragement, they began to offer countless stories of the friends they had lost, of how some of them had only had a chance to reconnect while others ached with a longing to do the same. My own grandmother opened up to me as she had not done with anyone in the family. In the middle of the brutal stories from refugee camps came in stories of a Hindu friend's Rajeshwari and Umma, of how my nani sister was saved by a Sikh family, of how her baby sister's nickname was kept by her father's Sikh friend. These were stories no one in my family had heard. Had I not probed, they would have passed away with my grandmother, as must have countless other uh, such tales uh, of millions of other grandparents held deeply seated in their hearts since 1947. Memory over time becomes selective. It filters out information. It gets influenced by meta-narratives, by tragic life experiences. When something as huge and traumatic as partition happens, other incidents and memories recede to the background. This is what I've found in many interviews, that, uh, many of people that I've interviewed. It is often with probing that other stories in reality that are less tragic come to the forefront. In her book, Since 1947, Partition Narratives Among Punjabi Migrants of Delhi, Ravinda Kaur shows how private and collective memories often influence each other and how meta and micro narratives often intertwine and profoundly impact individual experiences and memory. In reviewing her work, Rishi Batalia writes how partitioned refugees often personalize stories of general violence and trauma, telling and feeling them to be their own, and marking the shift in political climate location as personal felt things. For many of the people I interviewed, living in a, living in a country where TV programs, educational curriculum, political campaigns, and mainstream discourse all reinforce the bloodshed of partition and the need for separation, Personal memories also begin to absorb these narratives as their own, making it difficult to decipher between personal tragedies and collective understandings of the past, shaped by multiple and often external forces. It is then not a surprise that the violent stories were at the tip of the tongue for many people I spoke to, whereas other ones of bonds and desires often had to be pushed and prodded for. While hearing these stories, a slow process of unlearning began to take place in me. While my education and the mainstream discourse in and around me had made me believe that the dark accounts were the only accounts of history, that these were the only experiences my ancestors had, I began to learn that the pre-partition days were far more complex. There were no black and whites about good Muslims and bad Hindus or Sikhs. There were no stark dichotomies of treacherous and fiddles and innocent believers. These were individuals, children, men, and women. These were people who had lived together for generations. They remembered the turmoil of partition, but they also terribly ached to meet the Hindu and Sikh friends who had, who had been left behind. There was nostalgia, a longing to reconnect. This in no way discounts the violence of partition, but what was important was that if such recollections existed, they should have been shared and retold alongside other stories of partition, which were far darker and bloodier. 
And what I increasingly began to find was that these stories were missing, not just from my life, but also from those of thousands of other Pakistanis, both older and younger. And the result was a deep mistrust and animosity breeding in the Pakistani youth towards quote unquote the other. And even where they had been shared, it seemed like the jingoistic narratives predominant in society had stood in the way, and in many cases hijacked a more nuanced and holistic understanding of the past. This became even more obvious to me when CAP, the Citizens Archive, launched its Exchange for Change program in 2010. Heading it in Lahore and Islamabad for almost three years, I was meant to connect 5,000 school children aged between 10 and 14 in India and Pakistan through letters, photographs, oral histories, and finally a physical exchange. The idea behind the project was to encourage cross-cultural communication and give students on both sides of the border a clearer understanding of the shared history, culture, and lifestyles. A major goal of the project was to also challenge the negative stereotypes the young generation held of the other. As a result of over six decades of war and conflict, animosity, media propaganda, and limited people-to-people -people contact. It was in these workshops in Pakistan that I realized that the notion I had of partition in India was mirrored in these students' perspective. Thinking back, perhaps it was strange that CAP chose me to head this exchange, for I had my own stereotypes about them. However, given that I had studied with many Indian students for three years in Canada while completing my undergraduate degree meant that, that my opinions had become less hardline and what one may call more forward looking. Our history was bloody, but one couldn't blame all Indians for what had happened, just as one could not blame every German for the Holocaust. It was that simplistic. We had to forget the past and move forward. But these students belonging to low to upper to middle income schools had not had the same privileges to interact with Indians. As in my childhood, they too had only heard stories about enmity, rivalry, and revenge. For many of them, to contemplate being friends or even writing a letter to an Indian was nothing less than a sin. Indians had murdered Muslims, tortured their ancestors, snatched away their homes. What need was there to talk to such an enemy? They detested the Indians their own grandparents had grown up amongst. There was no room for dialogue, no need to cross over. Now, this section is in heads later on in the book, but as I went to India and I kind of sat in, in the classroom, Rooms and, and spoke with Indian students, many of these sentiments were echoed there as well. The, the synonymous way in which Pakistan um, and terrorism kind of become one, um, uh, the way that uh, the, the, these stereotypes and conceptions about Pakistan, but not just Pakistan, also Indian Muslims, the way that the villainized, scapegoated, and all of that, that, that very much came forward. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Conversing with the partition generation on one hand and these young students on the other, the disconnect between the two kept glaring back at me. Why was I finding so many children who were born decades after partition holding so much bitterness? When many of the forefathers had spent so many fond days amidst Hindu and Sikh friends, when many of them had tried desperately cr to cross the border to see their homes one more time, why were the younger generation so unwilling to talk, so unwilling to interact with the other? Was it because for many of their grandparents and great grandparents, the happy and peaceful memories were often seated in the subconscious and this simply had never been shared as my grandmother hadn't shared with me? Was it because our younger generations were learning a selected and censored version of history through textbooks and media propaganda and had a filtered understanding of 1947 as I did? And if this was the case, was there a way to revive stories from the first generation who served as walking, talking, living sources of history? It were these questions that pushed me to research and write this book. Through it, I have attempted to research how partition and the other are understood through the different generations and what changes, if any, there have been in this understanding over the years. So I'll stop uh, reading there. Uh, for this book, I, I conducted several interviews, but in the book, I, I've included 17 interviews, and they are split across different generations. Now, of course, there's no clear line between like where one generation starts and ends, but I consider myself somebody who was born in the late 1980s as, as a third generation, my grandmother kind of being the first. She was in her 20s at the time of partition. My mother was born very soon after partition. Um, so the, the interviews uh, across four generations, the eldest person I've personally ever interviewed was 112 and remembered uh, the British Raj and the youngest was a nine-year-old uh, student. So you see so much kind of, um, so much transformation across these generations. Uh, there are differences. There, each generation is not homogenous. I mean, depending on your interactions with the, with the other, um, depending on your education, depending on your family histories, a very different understanding can come about. Uh, but what I've noticed 
overall is that as we move further away from 1947, there's a growing kind of uh, hostility and a more packaged view of the past. Um, and that's, I think, what oral histories really offer. And they offered me in my personal journey, but I think they can really offer on a broader scale as well. They can kind of disrupt those packaged homogenous uh, ways in which we tell histories, the linear ways and the divided ways, right? So again, this is this is from a Pakistani perspective. Uh, when I'm talking to Indian students, they have their own limited, censored, filtered, distorted history in which the lines change. So the perpetrators become different. The perpetrators are Pakistanis. The perpetrators become Muslims. The, those are the ones that become villainized. The lines change, but that that linear way in which this history is furthered is very much uh, is very much there. Um, so, so through these oral histories uh, and through the work I did for this book and, and later on as well, what becomes apparent is that um, the, you know, these experiences have to be looked at across um, geography. And I think that's where, you know, Punjab versus Bengal become really important important because the kind of violence that Bengal has seen in my under limited understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, was much more protracted, was much more fragmented than the kind of overnight violence that Punjab saw. So there are those regional differences, Sindh experiences it very differently. Um, there are parts of India that have not uh, experienced it. There are parts of Pakistan, like, you know, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in the north, uh, Balochistan, that, that have a very, very different understanding and relationship. So those regional differences become very, very important. Differences across social class become important, gender, uh, caste, and so forth. Uh, but, um, you know, it is through these oral histories that we can kind of get to those differences and, and start to archive them before we lose them. Uh, it's through these oral histories that we can kind of look at that human dimension um, that Dr. Dr. Manan mentioned earlier as well. Um, but at the same time, as I kind of read out and as I mentioned earlier, I don't think in my work, I don't think that oral histories are completely insulated from these larger meta narratives that uh, are pervasive in society. I do think they have a very interesting relationship. So on one hand, oral histories have the power to kind of resist, challenge, um, and transform state narratives. Uh, and, and they very much do that. They offer us something different and new. At the same time, I also think that oral histories can get shaped. They shape state narratives, but they can also get shaped by state narratives. Um, so when certain histories get echoed again and again and again, people's memories, because memory, of course, gets it's diluted, it's get, it gets shaped and reshaped, it can also kind of uh, emphasize certain aspects and, and not emphasize other certain things get remembered, other things uh, are, are forgotten. And uh, what you see is because there's no one narrative of partition in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, across these three places, um, you, you, certain versions of history will uh, kind of come forth more quickly or more reluctantly, depending on where you do these interviews. Um, so while I was doing this, this research, as I did these interviews, I realized that, you know, depending on which side of the border you're at, it can be looked at as partition or independence. Right. Um, in Pakistan, as I mentioned, is very much linked to the birth, uh, the nation making, the birth making process and very much kind of seen the independence factor is, is focused on much more. Um, and the violence of partition then gets couched as as a larger kind of sacrifice uh, for that uh, nation making process, um, depending on what side of the border you're at. Again, is it loss or is it triumph? Is it the breakup of the motherland or is it the making of the motherland? Is it a tragedy? Or as I mentioned earlier, is it a sacrifice? Um, are those who stayed back loyal citizens? And does that make those who left treacherous? Um, do we want to focus on Hindu and Sikh intolerance? Or do we want to focus on uh, Muslim fanatics? Uh, is it an ultimate victory? Uh, or was it a temporary compromise when we look at Bangladesh, right? Uh, so depending on where you are, all kinds of different questions are raised. Um, you know, does August mark mark independence uh, in, in Pakistan? Does it mark partition, loss or triumph? All of these things. Um, and so even seven decades after partition, the terms we use, the language we use, the way in which we speak of partition, imagine partition, define partition remains very, very uh, complex. And the ways in which states construct these narratives has an impact on what can or cannot be shared. Uh, for instance, I'll give you an example. In, in Pakistan, where August marks the making of a nation, in India, partition conscious of different images, right? In, in my interviews uh, in India, the nostalgia is far more easily evoked uh, in partition survivors sitting there as, as compared to those in Pakistan. Now, in Pakistan, the stories of 
bloodshed of sacrifice are more forthcoming. It's not that Pakistanis are not nostalgic. I read you so many narratives of their nostalgia. It's not as if, you know, Indian partition survivors are not cognizant or do not remember, are not impacted by that violence. Of course they are. But it's about which ones, which narratives are a little bit more comfortable, which ones are more convenient, which ones are a little bit more forthcoming, uh, which ones are at the tip of the tongue. Um, so, so yeah, I think that that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, the impact of state narratives of people is not limited, of course, to the partition generation. It also has an impact on the younger generations. In my discussions with Indian uh, students, for instance, children often tell me that uh, Indian leaders never wanted partition. It was the Muslim League that insisted on creating a separate Muslim nation. Now, this is a simplistic narrative, of course, and it's accepted as the indisputable truths by many Indians and brushes over the intricacies of pre-partition politics, presenting Muslims alone to have broken the country and then feeds into the larger narrative of disloyal citizens, which has a grave impact on, on uh, Muslims today. On the other side of the border in Pakistan, when we look at it as a we look at it as a nation making of a Muslim country, then what happens to religious minorities there and what are the repercussions there? So uh, these, these impacts are not, not limited. They're kind of the, the dynamic, they shift, and they continue to have a uh, grave impact. It was because actually uh, these different narratives started to emerge for me. It's because I started to realize that the homogenous understanding I grew up with had to be fractured and had to be challenged in many ways. Um, that I got interested then in, in looking at um, history beyond beyond 1947 and beyond Punjab as well. I wanted to look at the ongoing manifestations of partition and the violence in Kashmir. So I worked on the line of control. And it was while I was on the line of control that I realized that India and Pakistan's policies in the region and in Kashmir particularly cannot really be understood if you do not look at 1971 and the birth of Bangladesh and the war with Pakistan. And so that's how I kind of came to 1971. Uh, interestingly, as compared to the partition, I mentioned earlier that in Punjab, there's very much a narrative, there's very much a conversation, a discourse, a limited, distorted discourse, but very much a discourse about partition. Um, as compared to that, there is a, a very kind of eerie silence about 1971. Uh, when it is remembered, uh, it is remembered very, very selectively. Um, the scale of atrocities, the scale of violence has still never been acknowledged or recognized, um, let alone apologized for. So there was there was a lot to kind of peel through. And and my, you know, that's that's what took me to Bangladesh. My focus remained 1971. But during the course of that work, of course, I did like look at 1947 um, as well. Um, and and you know how how differently that's kind of imagined and uh shaped and reshaped by what happened after that, right? Like 1947 happens, and by 1952, uh, you have students being killed. Over, over language, right, um, of the basic right to speak in Bengali. Um, so how does that complicate the relationship to 1947, to what 1947 was meant to represent, and how that very much kind of gets overshadowed um, and consumed by what happens in 1971? So, uh, so that's, the, that's the 1971 book. Um, it includes interviews from uh, Bangladeshis, Indians, as well as Pakistanis, and again compares these uh, personal histories to the state narratives um, and to how 1971 is imagined today. Uh, like partition, the three very different narratives, depending on what side of the border you are, there's different language. In Pakistan, it's referred to as the dismemberment. In Bangladesh, of course, it's the liberation. Um, and these semantics, uh, these politics of language are very, very important because they shape the memory of these events. So the whole Hope through this book is both uh, one to archive the stories uh, for future generations so that we are not left with the distorted history um, and the very, very censored history of 1971, but to, to also look at uh, those state narratives and, and how they're shaping our understanding today, that interaction um, between the two. 